Oh, it's being recorded. We'll just say then it's been recorded. So if you, you click on participants down below. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. And all oh right, yeah, attendees. And then I'll admit them. Oh, I recognize names there, which is nice as well. I'll probably hear you. Um, Good afternoon, everybody. We're just going to um, give it a wee minute or two so everybody can join. I can't manage to admit people here. Hang on. I don't know if you have to admit people to this one, Anna. Hmm. Oh yeah, right now. Hi, Kira. Hi, So we'll just give it a few more minutes to see um, <clears throat> if there's any more people to join in. There's quite a quite a large number on today, so it's good to see. Give it another wee minute and see. Sure. Also, um, this webinar is being recorded, just to let you know, because there's some schools who couldn't attend today, so um, we don't want them to miss out. It's great to see everybody saying hello. I know. We can use the chat box. <clears throat> Still people joining here, so we'll give it a minute. <clears throat> We've got um, P4 at Carrick Model, and we've got Grady Jubilee Primary School. Year six and seven in Killen Primary School, Port Rush Primary, P5, Hard Primary School, the Dean's Primary School, McGilligan. Hi, Siobhan and Siobhan Convy from St. Mary's the Hill and Bronan Aldoon from St. McNeese's. A, a lot of these names I've, uh, I'm recognising here, so it's good to see that we're all getting. It is indeed. I've got Melbourne Primary School, St Mary's, people Oh, Club. there's Helena Lamrock. Oh, I know her husband. Young Gareth. <laughs> mm -hmm. We've got St Columbus Primary School, uh, St Mary's, P6 in Portland. Own. That's terrific. Conkill, though. Widespread from everywhere. It's great. And then there's Liz on, which is great. So um, Liz Farnan, who is a, does deliver biodiversity workshops. Well, well, I'll tell you what, we'll make a start. And if anyone comes on, as I say, it is being recorded anyway. So um, my name's Anna Green, and I'm one of the field officers for Eco Schools in Cape Northern Ireland Beautiful. Um, I work um, in uh, Belfast City Council, Antrim Newton Abbey and um, Lisburn and Castle Ray, but we do go all around in Ireland and there are different field officers specific to specific areas. So um, welcome everyone today. As I said, it's great to see so many schools here, so many different age groups as well. So, and it's lovely for you all to be able to, you know, find out exactly what we're going to be doing. So. Um, as I say, this is funded by Danske Bank. Um, it's a project that we have done previously. Um, there may also be people on here from projects, the Radius Project and the Apex Housing Project, as they are kind of quite similar. Um, so 
I would just say if you have any questions, um, if you want to put them into the chat and then we can um, we'll look into those at the very end. So I'm going to introduce you to Jilly, who is our biodiversity strategic lead, and um, she's going to talk you through exactly what's going to be happening. So off you go, Jilly. Well, indeed. So, yeah, good afternoon, everybody. It's lovely to see so many of you. Um, I'm just going to share my screen with you. And can everybody see that okay? Is that okay, Anna? Yes, I can see it perfectly, yep. Brilliant. So, yes, good afternoon. My my name is Julie Duggan. I head up Biodiversity Recovery at Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful, which um, also runs and organises Eco Schools as well. So you can see that it's not Thursday the 2nd of March, as it says in that slide. It is Wednesday the 2nd of March, so you're not living in a kind of a time warp. Um, but I'm delighted to be here today um, to just go through um, the importance of outdoor learning um, how we can reconnect with nature, um, the biodiversity crisis and what we can do to battle that, um, how you can discover local biodiversity in your school grounds and individual actions and challenges you can take either as an individual or in your school to help address that. Um, so the Outdoor Learning Garden Project um, with Danske Bank um, is a project that, as Anna said, we delivered last year to 11 schools in 11 council areas. Um, and we created 11 outdoor learning gardens with um, fruit trees and fruit bushes. So it was very much about um, encouraging children to get outside um, and appreciate the outdoors but also there's like a permanent garden there with fruit trees and fruit bushes, which will be there for many, many years for the school and for the pupils to enjoy. And also, we, obviously we have an education package around this and, and that is, this is the first webinar in this series. Um, so it's kind of just setting the scene and um, we have a wee video sort of about biodiversity. And so hopefully, there be something for everybody there. Um, so the importance of outdoor learning. So the way that school grounds are developed, used and managed can have a really um, significant impact on pupils' attitudes and behaviours towards school, each other and the wider environment and society generally. So being outdoors, I think, means that you notice more things in your environment. Um, so you might notice the trees and the flowers, the birds and the bees and the insects, because you can see them or hear them, touch them, or indeed smell them in terms of flowers, um, or all of those things put together. So perhaps if you were in an orchard with ripe fruit or a herb or vegetable garden, you'd also be able to taste them. And I know that quite a lot of schools do grow um, vegetables already. Um, and this week, of course, I was at a, a school that had a polyton, which was really impressive. So being outdoors makes you aware of all of your senses and of the things that are happening around you in your environment. Um, and then when we're outside, we start to notice, are there places for birds and animals and insects to live? Is, is there a lot of litter? Um, how can we make things better for them? Um, because we're sharing our outdoor space with all of those creatures. And when we learn to love the outdoors, we learn that it's the responsibility really of all of us to protect nature. And I know that um, obviously the last couple of years have been pretty difficult for everybody. And we're, we're all aware of the devastating impact that COVID-19 has had um, on the world generally. Um, and if there has been one positive, I think that many of us have begun to reconnect with nature and value the nature that we have on our doorsteps. So our local parks and green areas have helped all of us through these very tough times and it's important that we look after them. So many of you taking part in this project um, maybe have been key workers' children. 
Um, and this project hopefully will give you the opportunity to get outdoors and make a difference as well. So let's return the favour to nature because nature has been good to us um, and we hope to be able to show you how to do that. So um, biodiversity, that's a pretty big word and I know some of you um, will know what it means, some of you will have heard of it but not really know what it means and some of you mightn't have heard of it at all but biodiversity basically means um, all of the living things on earth and in the sea. And I have um, a really good short video, it's only three minutes long, um, that I'd like to show you because that explains it better than anything by David Attenborough. So I'm just going to play this. <laughs> Biodiversity is a term that represents the total variety of all life on Earth. That's a big thing to sum up. Thousands of different wild habitats, millions of different species, billions of different individuals, and the trillions of different characteristics they all have. The total biodiversity of our planet is immense. Which is a good thing, because the more biodiversity, the more secure all life on Earth is, including ourselves. Only when life is at its most varied, vigorous, biodiverse, can we hope to thrive. We may not know it, but we need towering forests across one third of the land surface to lock away carbon and keep the climate stable. We need millions of pollinators and billions of soil organisms and megatons of plankton to keep the food we eat in supply. We need strange plants deep in jungles to create our medicines and coral reefs and mangrove swamps to protect the coasts we depend upon. Our planet's biodiversity provides all the things we need for free but it will only do so if there's lots of it. And at the moment, it's under attack. In the last 50 years, our activities have dramatically reduced biodiversity across the globe. We've snuffed out habitats, reduced populations of wild animals by 60%, and even driven whole species extinct. The number of lions in Africa has dropped by 65%. The number of individual flying insects in Europe has dropped by 75%. The number of bluefin tuna in the Pacific has dropped by 95%. Biodiversity is dropping everywhere and fast. This is catastrophic for nature and therefore ourselves. We talk about climate change a lot. But biodiversity loss is as important an issue. How do we stop this loss of life? How do we ensure that biodiversity, our planet's vital statistic, begins to increase again? In fact, we already know exactly what to do. Follow our planet Visit ourplanet.com and watch the series on Netflix. Whoops. Okay. I think that's um I think that's a brilliant video by David Attenborough. Uh, excuse me, I'm just gonna start the slideshow again. Okay. So yes, so biodiversity um, or biological diversity is the amazing variety of all the living things on our planet. Um, so that's from plankton to wildflowers, from insects to mammals, reptiles, trees, birds. Um, it also applies to the habitats in which these living things are to be found. So that's the oceans, 
woodlands, meadows and wetlands, as well as man-made places such as fields, parks and canals, and even so-called wasteland can be a rich source of biodiversity and also school grounds, of course. There are so many schools um, across Northern Ireland that can you imagine if they were all managed to, to the maximum benefit for biodiversity, how much better that would be. So each of the species on Earth works together in a thing called ecosystems. So supporting everything in nature that we humans need to survive. So that's clean air and clean water, food, shelter, fuel, and even medicines. Um, and for instance, can you think in terms of food? Did you know that bees as pollinators allow us to have an awful lot of the foods that we eat? So think of, of all the fruits, think of tomatoes, all of those need to be pollinated by a little insect. Um, in terms of medicines like morphine and codeine, um, those drugs are derived from the opium poppy and are used to treat patients in severe pain in hospital, for instance, after an operation or something. And then, of course, trees um, absorb carbon dioxide and emit oxygen for us to breathe. So everything kind of works together and everything around us is really, really important. Um, and I'm sure after this workshop, you may be, um, be able to have a discussion about what you can find at your school and where you live. So we've put together a few slides of what might be common around your school. Um, we've got plants. So there's there are plants here you, you mightn't have heard of. Um, and the top left one is stinking bob or stinking robert. It's a very common flower that you'll see by the sides of the roads and in parks. Um, it's got a pink flower which looks very pretty, but, but it can be quite smelly to some people. Um, then next to it, it is another unusual name for a plant called toad flax, although I'm sure you've seen that everywhere. Um, and this flower loves to grow in the cracks in old stone walls. So keep an eye, eye out for it. Um, you might even see it grown out of cracked pavements. Daffodils, um, some of the first signs of spring. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen those yellow daffodils um, coming up in the last few weeks. Um, hawthorn hedges. So hawthorn is a native tree species and you can recognise it by the shape of the leaves. Look out for it. It produces really lovely haw berries in the autumn um, um, for the birds and birds love those. Um, they're a bit too bitter for humans, but it's good to leave, this, to leave as much as we can for the birds anyway. Um, oak trees. You can recognise oaks by the shape of their leaves um, and look out for acorns on mature trees and by mature trees, we mean trees that are like 20 plus years old. And then docks, um, I'm sure anybody who has got um, somebody who looks after them, who's a gardener, hears them complain about docks, but docks are said to be um, good for nettle stings. And I don't know if you've ever been stung by a nettle, have you been advised to rub one on the nettle sting? Cause it actually really, really does work. What else we've got? We've got a uh, brambles. So brambles produce delicious blackberries um, in the late summer into early autumn. Um, now they do have sharp thorns, but actually it's kind of worth it for the lovely things you can make out of blackberries. Um, and we've got a crab apple tree there as well. So, and birds, the type of birds that you might see in your gardens and your schools in Northern Ireland are um, the little robin, robin redbreast, I'm sure everybody knows what they look like. There are also um, blue tits. And um, in terms of birds, there are lots of different types of tits. You've got cold tit, great tit, long tail tit, um, but they all are slightly different and slightly different colouring. So it's worth getting to know and identify those. Um, common birds are also the chaffinch, wood pigeon, I'm sure um, lots of you have seen wood pigeons around um, starlings and starlings are the birds that fly around in big gangs and big groups um, and make loads of noise and very lovely bird, um, I have to say, very cheery. Sparrows, sparrows actually are 
um, have been in decline, but um, used to be very, very common everywhere. And then the little wren, wren is one of our um, smallest birds, and you can see them sort of flitting about, um, kind of about waist height. Um, adorable, really good, and we're very, I'm very lucky where I live to have a few of them around the house. So, um, so at the other thing about the wren is it is it's very shy. So um, you might not be lucky enough to see that unless you kind of sit really quietly and take your time. So um, those are birds. And then in terms of animals, so we have squirrels, of course. Um, this squirrel in the picture, I don't know if you know what type of squirrel that is, but it's you would tell from the color of its coat that it's a red squirrel. Um, which is native to Ireland. Now there are um, there are lots of grey squirrels around, and I'd say if you know you've been to the park and you see squirrels, that's what they will be. And the grey squirrel were introduced here um, many years ago, and have sort of competed with the red squirrel. Um, so and red squirrels love like pine trees and stuff. So um, lots of work. Good work's been done by Ulster Wildlife and different organisations to try and encourage more red squirrels. Um, mice, um, and we're not just talking about um, the mice you might get in your house, but there are also field mice as well. This field mice in the picture is eating some of the hawthorn berries that we talked about earlier. Um, badgers, um, did you know that generations of badger families can live in the same set? So that's the underground home that they create for themselves for hundreds of years, literally, if they're not disturbed. Um, and so lots of places are even named after these badger homes, would you believe? Frogs, um, if you see a frog, and actually you might start to see them at this time of year because they'll be coming out to um, lay their eggs, the frog spawn. Uh, be careful not to pick them up with your bare hands as acids on your hands can harm the frog. Um, but if you do pick them up with your bare hands, make sure you put them um, back right beside water, for example, a pond. Um, bats, bottom right hand corner, bats. Um, the, could you guess from looking at that bat what kind of bat it is? I think the clue is in, is in the ears. If you look at its ears, it's actually called a long eared bat. Um, and what it's and it's one of we've got nine species of bats in Ireland, so that's one of them. We've got um, rabbits and hares. The hare is the one with the bigger animal with the longer ears. Um, and did you know? Maybe you didn't know that rabbits are not actually native to Ireland, but they were introduced here by the Normans nine hundred years ago. So I suppose they've every right to be here now, haven't they? Um, and then. Insects. Um, we've got an array of insects here as well. Actually, one of them is not an insect. So I don't know if you can, if anybody knows the answer, you can maybe get your teacher to put it in the chat box for you. Um, but um, yes, yeah, so what have we got? We've got what we've we got, we've got butterflies here. Um, the one shown is called a small tortoiseshell butterfly. It's one of the first signs of spring um, and the caterpillars of this butterfly eat nettles. So actually leaving a wee messy area with some nettles is a really good thing to do in your garden and in your school as well. Um, a moth, this beautifully coloured moth is called an elephant hawk moth and it's about half the size of your hand. Um, so really quite rare and we don't see them that often but they are amazing when you do. Um, worms, did you know that they are the ecosystem engineers? They absolutely are. And so they work their way through the soil and add oxygen um, to the soil, which is very useful for every plant that grows there um, and useful in your school garden, of course. So when we're out planting your trees, we invariably come across worms all the time. Um, and when we start, we'll set up a designated like worm hotel. So every time you find a worm, we'll just carefully move it out of the way and move it to the worm hotel so that it's safe and sound. Um, then shield bug, the green bug there on the left. Um, they, uh, you can find these on trees and in hedges. Um, 
and they're green obviously because um it's really good camouflage for them they look really really exotic don't they but actually you see them in northern ireland all the time um ladybirds ladybirds um are amazingly creatures that do us far good by eating aphids, which might be attacking our plants. Um, and there are actually 18 species of ladybird in Ireland. Um, and the spots on their back and the slight variation in colour tell us um, which species they belong to. So um, we've also got millipede there, a dragonfly and a daddy long legs. Um, and just in case you were wondering, the um, the one creature that isn't actually an insect is the spider, because it's it's called an arachnid. So film marks for anybody who got that, which is brilliant. So, um, so anyway, as we mentioned, there there is a bit of a crisis at the minute with biodiversity. So. As the human race expands and we put increasing pressure on the planet's resources, um, the balance of our ecosystems is being upset. Um, sometimes to the point when many species might be threatened with extinction if we don't um, start doing something about that. So protecting biodiversity and helping it to recover will ensure we all continue to enjoy the benefits of the environment, such as the clean air and water and healthy, nutritious food. Um, so um, in this report that came out, um, very recently, it's called the State of Nature Report, and it shows that um, that we have a decline. So you can you can see there that the figures in the red um, have have declined since 1970 by um, by 41%. Um, and where they are found, so that's the areas where they might be found, has um, decreased by 27%. So, um, and it's quite, I suppose, quite frightening that 11%, so that's 11 out of 100 species that are being assessed um, could be threatened with extinction, actually. So, so climate change is having an impact on nature in the UK, um, and we can see we can see the change in migratory migratory birds. So like swallows and great tits. So these birds um, are arriving back with us in the UK and the Ireland up to fifteen days earlier, um, and breeding up to eleven days earlier than they did in the nineteen sixties. And you might think, well, sure what do a few days matter? But actually when you're a very small creature like a bird and you're trying to raise young, if you're out of um, kilter with your food source, so that's when the insects are available or the worms, you know, or the weather, then that can have a big, big impact. Um, and I suppose some of the drivers for change in Northern Ireland, um, for climate change are um, urbanisation. So, you know, with but lots of towns and cities, um, there's pollution obviously from you know um, from factories and manufacturing and cars and um, how we manage our woodlands and um, fisheries and you know how we fish the oceans is can have an impact too. Um, invasive non-native species. So I know we talked about the grey squirrel earlier, but we also have a lot of plant invasive species that um, that take over our native plants and um, freshwater management um, and also agriculture management. So how farms um, are managed and you know whether chemicals are used for, for fertilizer or for clearing the ground and stuff. Um, but anyway, as I said, that all does seem very doom and gloom, doesn't it? Um, and it's important to recognise that um, our emotions, and it can be worrying when you watch what is happening to biodiversity across the world um, and how quickly it is happening. So we want to help you deal with your worry by carrying out a positive challenge or action to help with um, the biodiversity crisis. And that, you know, by... Um, by looking at your school grounds, um, by going in and um, we're going to plant apple trees, some apple trees, some pear trees, some plum trees, 
blueberries, um, raspberries, black currants, um, strawberries, um, and create a lovely place for you to be outside, but that will also help all the creatures that are outside as well. Um, and because those are trees and you know they're fairly big, it means you don't have to be cutting the grass along the bottom of them all the time because grass is an important habitat too. Um, so, um, yeah, so take the takeaway message obviously is you can play your part to help. Um, and all the while you can have fun as well. So I think there's nothing nicer, hopefully you know already, um, that when you get outside and you're from about with your friends and you know maybe you're collecting leaves or you're doing other challenges with your teachers that um that it just turns into good fun and it's not and all the time you're learning but it doesn't actually feel like you are learning so um so we've got eight actions and um, to help living things where you live um there are a few things we need to provide, okay? So food in the form of plants and flowers, shelter for nesting and safety um, from chemicals and safety from litter. So, um, so we'll go through the eight actions. I suppose first one is leave a corner of your garden to grow wild, to provide a place for local wildlife to live and to feed. So do you remember we just talked about um, how the caterpillars need to eat the nettles? Well, um, I think at home and in schools as well, sometimes things can be super, super, super tidy. And actually there's no need for every place to be that tidy and having a, a little wild bit to one side or um, perhaps planting some native hedging. And by native hedging, we mean things like um, hawthorn and, and gelder rose and spindle and blackthorn and things that you would find in the hedges in the countryside um, that really helps. Um, if you've room in your garden, um, so plant flowering hedges or flowering shrubs or trees. Um, and if you're not sure what to plant, there's a brilliant website um, called the All Ireland Pollinator Plan, which will give you a variety of, of plants and flowers and trees and stuff that are really good for pollinating insects. Um, or you can ask at your local garden centre and they should be able to help you as well. And actually another really good way to um, know whether a plant is good for pollinators or not is if you're in your garden centre, say late spring, summertime, just stand and watch to see where the bumblebees and solitary bees um, might be might be going to. And whatever flowers they're landing on are the kind of flowers you want to be growing in your garden. Um, pesticides and herbicides. So um, it's really important not to spray pesticides or herbicides, which is like a weed killer around your property. So again, I know it comes back to everything or everybody wants everything to look super, super tidy all the time. But actually by spraying herbicides and weed, weed killers, we can be affecting um, some of the creatures who, who live around there without knowing about it. So, um, so grass is good. What else? So create, um, create a nesting habitat or bug hotel for solitary bees. So, and I know quite a few of you already have something like that in your school and um, I know some of you have like um, bug hotels that are made out of pallets maybe two pallets stacked up together and you've got um, some bricks and rocks and logs and um, twigs straw different kinds of natural materials um, for um, for all sorts of insects to live in and that's a that's a really really good thing Obviously, you can, um, there are off the shelf ones you can buy where um, they do look like wee homes and they've got holes drilled in them, which are really good for um, bumblebees or solitary bees to, um, to lay their eggs in for, for over winter. And then in the springtime, the new bees will um, appear from there. So 
creating nesting habitats and bug hotels um, and you know it could be two or three in different um, parts of your garden is a really really good thing um, planting pollinator friendly bulbs the floor next spring so um, so things like I know we talked about daffodils before and how they're lovely and yellow and sunny um, and they're bright in everybody's day but actually things like daffodils and tulips are not really the best for pollinating insects. Um, you're much better to grow things like crocuses and snowdrops if you can. Um, and the great thing about spring bulbs is you don't have to replace those um, because when they die back in the springtime, just let them die back um, and they, they will stay under the ground all year and then next spring up they'll come again and actually if you um they will probably replicate in that way so if you put out a small amount of snowdrop um bulbs they can turn into a whole swathe over time which is absolutely brilliant um other other bulbs um which are really good for pollinators are like the grape hyacinth you know the wee blue ones called mascara um, actually, I have some here. I kind of forgot. I had, um, hopefully you can see that. Um, and when they when they have died back, I will plant them outside in my garden as well. So, um, and then what else? I mean, other, nobody likes to live in a messy environment uh, in terms of litter. So be sure not to drop litter. Um, around because it can create all sorts of dangers for all sorts of insects so if you know especially if it's like plastic bags or crisp packets or plastic bottles um or bottle tops because um weight creatures they can get trapped inside there or they can eat it um and it can choke them as well um, and if it's something like a tin can or glass or something um obviously that can can cause damage as well so um be sure not to drop litter around your school grounds or outside or anywhere actually and also don't be afraid to pick up others litter i mean it's an awful thing that we have to but um if you have a pair of gloves or a litter picker that's a really good thing to do collectively um as as class in school so if you have grass you can um, again we talked about the spray and stuff but um leaving grass to grow and letting it get quite long is a really good thing so you can leave a strip of it unmown and um, so that native flowers like clover and buttercups um can flower and provide food for pollinators and this is all natural food that um would be growing round about anyway so um and then pots if you've got pots or window boxes or hanging baskets um choose plants which are good for pollinators again um, such as flowering herbs or uh, so by flowering herbs we kind of mean um i mean thyme is a lovely herb that um, bees absolutely love and other pollinating insects um wallflowers bellflowers trailing verbena uh, lavender even cosmos um really big blousy flowers and lots of different colors and um, i think if you painted a flower it's kind of a cosmos that you're thinking of and um, so like pink petals yellow center look gorgeous really good for insects as well um with things like the poached eggplant which grows really easily from seeds um and, and other herbs like chives for instance, or fennel, herb fennel, um, which are really good insects as well. So um, there are lots more. And as I say, you can, um, there are lots of websites that will give you lists. So um, there's a junior pollinator plan on the All Ireland Pollinator Plan website. Um, and lots of ideas there about other things you can do to, um, to help in your school growing so and of course we have um i just wanted to say that obviously we're doing this project with you but um in april live here love here which is also part of keep northern Ireland beautiful um is launching another schools pollinator grant 
and this school is this grant is for schools that are in urban and rural areas so it's kind of any school in Northern Ireland including universities um, because before it was just for rural just for country schools um, and those grants um, are can provide funding from three thousand pounds up to twelve thousand um, pounds which is quite a lot of money actually for you to improve um, your school grounds for pollinators so you might want to buy um, trees or fruit trees or, or put in raised beds or plant a native hedge or um, have a no mow wildflower area stuff like that um, it also funds um, accessibility so you know you might want some outdoor furniture and stuff like that so since you're part of this project we will be sending you a link obviously um, whenever those are launched and we hope that um, quite a few of you if you have the need would apply for those which would be brilliant so um that's we're going to take some questions now um eco schools and i obviously is on facebook instagram and twitter um, and we through the project we'd love to see um to hear your stories and see your photographs and um yeah and just i'm sure all of that with with other schools so i'm going to stop sharing now and i'm going to look at some of the q a so has anybody any questions from any of the children you'd like to get through thank you Danny. <coughs> No, no, no question at the moment, but as I say, um, if any of the children have anything they want to ask, that would be great. It would be great. Actually, can um, any children want to, to, to let us know what kind of animals or creatures or birds or insects they have around your school? Mm. I'm sure a lot of the um, urban or the rural schools would have a lot going on about them. You know, they would have a lot of different wee animals running about. I see um, Elizabeth has added, and thank you, Elizabeth, that um, that um, she saw the bees flying around lavender plants at her local garden centre, so that's why she bought them. It is it is a good way, if you're not sure, just stand for a wee while. Um, so what have we got from Melbourne Primary School? What is the most enjoyable aspect of your job? Um, well, I think I'll go first, Anna, will I? Um, I love my job. I love I love being outside. Um, I love hearing the bird song in the morning time. I I grow a lot of food. Um, at home I have been doing that for the last sixteen years. Um, actually, so and I still get a real buzz from that. So I I love to um, I love to grow food. I've got a polytunnel, and you know we grow lots of salad leaves and lots of herbs, and we've got a mini orchard. Um, and I have one chicken because her friend, one chicken, yeah, her friend died um, a couple of years ago. We never, it's hard when you've got one chicken because if you bring another one in, she will bully it. Um, and if you bring two in, they will bully her. So she actually seems quite happy on her own. Um, and she's so old, we can't even remember what age she is. But we do get an egg every now and again. But so... Yes, I have a chicken, but I also keep honeybees as well. I've got four honeybee hives. Um, so I love getting out to schools and, and helping teach um, people in schools and children about fruit and fruit trees. And, and actually, it's really quite easy. And things like blueberries, which can be really expensive in the supermarket, mm -hmm. are, are really very easy to grow. In Northern Ireland so hopefully through this project and what we plant in your school um, and through the workshops you know we do um, we will do tasting workshops in the autumn time where you know first year you mightn't have that much growing but we go and buy local pears and plums and apples and we get blueberries and raspberries and stuff and we bring them all to your school and um, along with some nice vanilla yogurt and stuff um, and you can make sundaes and um, 
So that's all that's all good fun. And actually the amount of people who the amount of children who have a new favorite fruit, you know, such as a, a, a pear or plum after the workshops this year was brilliant. Yeah, we have a, a lot of questions here, Tilly. So oh, um, um, Lisa McElwain, I believe that they have um, red squirrels in the school grounds and listen ski, which is brilliant. Oh, that is so good. Brilliant. Let's get ski. photos of them. That would be absolutely perfect. That would be, I'm sure, you know, everyone would love to see those. Um, we have a question here. that um, Any ideas for what to plant in raised beds? Something that's kind of easy to maintain? Okay, so raised beds, um, you can you can grow, it depends whether you want like permanent things or, or things that grow every year. And I know it's tricky in schools because, um, because you're off July and August as well. But um, I think herbs are a really good thing to grow in raised beds. So you could have a row of parsley that you grow from seed a row of coriander that you go from seed. You could have a couple of wee rows of salad leaves. Um, and then you could have, um, you could have things like rosemary and thyme. Mint is, actually mint is a thing that spreads really easily and very quickly. So if you're gonna grow mint in school, I would try and grow it on its own or grow it in a big pot so that it can't take over everything else but um but raised beds are brilliant for um and you know like spring onions and carrots for baby carrots and um potatoes as well of course um there's actually a really good website Sia and I have a really good website called growing for the future um I and they made there are lesson plans there for primary schools as well and they actually they um, came out to my house for a full year every month and filmed um, us making raised beds or making compost or um, and things that are very applicable to a school year as well. So if you go to CFNI um, and search for Growing for the Future project, um, that website's really, really worth looking at. And it's kind of a school, a calendar year, you know, what to do when kind of thing, which is pretty um, we have a question here, Jilly. Have you been on news desk? Uh, no. <laughs> no, they wouldn't let me in the telly, would they? <laughs> Say you're famous and I never knew. Oh, no. um, <laughs> From Newcastle Primary, no, yeah. no. Um, no. Rona, um, has said, what kind of plants would be suitable for caterpillars to live and grow? Okay, well, so, do you know what? Um, like butterflies and moths are really. Um, they're all, they all have kind of specific needs. So, you know, nettles are really good for them. But, you, I mean, you have different caterpillars that will, um, obviously, the cabbage white butterfly caterpillar loves anything that's like a brassica. So you're, if you're growing cabbages or kale or, um, and I'm sure if you've ever tried to grow those, you, you need to, um, you know, you'll come out one day and everything will sort of be chewed and you wonder what's happened and you look in and there are wee caterpillars and stuff so you know whole variety of stuff is great for lots of different species and mm -hmm. um, so as I say leave leave a messy area leave some nettles there but um but you know like it, like clover you know is is a brilliant thing too um for you know for feeding pollinating insects and stuff so it's just it's kind of like um, just leave as much variety as you can. Brilliant. Um, and then we have primary six from St. Aidan's and they're wanting to know where do seeds come from? Oh, good question. Okay, so seeds normally come from a flower, okay, or a fruit. So if you, so you know the way you grow flowers, um, you know, and they, they come up and they flower and they bloom and they're lovely, maybe for weeks and weeks and weeks, and then they die back. Well, when they die back, that's, um, they've usually produced seeds then, and you can save those seeds when they're really dry and sow them next year again. Um, and then you've got, um, you've got fruits. So fruits, which are produced by flowers. So you think about, you know, apples, plums, pears, blueberries, raspberries, strawberries, all of those produce flowers. Along come the bees and other pollinating insects. 
um, and moves the pollen around those flowers and that's what turns them into fruits. Um, and then the seeds, um, when those fruits are mature, they'll have seeds inside. So think about, um, you know, actually strawberries are the one thing that has seeds on the outside. Mm. Um, you know, you get that wee texture on the outside. So think about, you know, when you open an apple inside, there are seeds and things. Um, um, what else? But, and, you know, blueberries. And stuff. if you think about tomatoes as well, or chilies or peppers, whenever you open them up, you'll see the seeds inside. And actually, if you scoop those out and dry them on a piece of kitchen paper, and um, make sure they're really, really dry, you can save those and grow those as well into new chilies or peppers or um, tomatoes too. And uh, St Columbus, I'd love to go and visit St Columbus because they have a pizza circle. Um, I know, sounds great. And um, they grow lots of different herbs there and they have raised bays with lots of different vegetables. And they have a little stream and cows at the other side of the fence. So it sounds idyllic. You know, we could sit relax there and have a little have a little slice of pizza. Sounds brilliant. Um, Siobhan, what are the best plants to plant in small school grounds? So I know I know the school grounds and they're quite limited with um, green space. Sure, sure. Well, look, you um, it, so in terms of fruit bushes and fruit trees that we're planting in the schools, um, they're kind of semi dwarfing or or semi vigorous, so it they don't go into a huge big fruit tree that you need a ladder to pick the apples and stuff from. Um, so they'll grow kind of sort of like a person height. Or a bit more than that and you then they will produce fruit so those are quite good and um, if you've got uh things like blueberries grow really well in big pots too so i find actually that um that depending on what you're growing the bigger the pot the better because then you have to water it less and um, so if you have something that's sort of jammed in quite a small pot then it's actually quite difficult to keep that growing. So it's good to pot something on, give it plenty of space um, and it gets plenty of nutrition as well. Um, small spaces, you know, you can, um, you can grow vertically too, even using like guttering or some spouting or stuff like that. You can, uh, pea shoots. I like, I'm always going on about growing pea shoots. Um, because you can use any dried pea at all. You can do them in the classroom, outside the classroom. You can bring in old yogurt pots or grape punnets or um, anything at all that will hold some compost. Um, sprinkle over dried peas and it, it's those marifat peas, you know, the bigger peas, Buchanan's peas, the ones you buy in the corner shop. I think they're like 65p a packet or something. Um, and there's loads and loads and loads of peas in them. Um, and they will produce pea shoots for you, which you can eat in salad, pasta, sandwiches, just like a wee snack. And they'll be up in like two weeks, which is incredible. Yeah, I think that's on Growing Through the Future project mm -hmm. website as well. The whole pea shoot thing. So, um, so try and think about things that grow quickly. So if and even you can have spuds, like early varieties of potatoes will grow really well in like compost bags or potato bags or big, big pots. So there's there's lots of things you can do in, in small school grounds. It's just getting a wee bit more creative with that. Yeah. We have a couple of different schools um, and they are uh, going to be getting a polytunnel and just love to know what kind of, what would be the best things to grow in the polytunnel? Oh, uh, polytons are, are great because they do lengthen out the season for you. So um, I would always advise people, if you have a polytunnel um, and you also have outdoor space, keep the polytunnel for the things that really benefit from heat. So, um, so I wouldn't put potatoes in my polytunnel because I can grow them outside um, or cabbages or big things like that that are going to be in the ground for, for quite a long time and actually might need quite a lot of water as well. So those things are all better outside. Um, I would grow my polytunnel things like tomatoes, 
Um, I would grow some spinach as well. I would grow some herbs and um, things like coriander and parsley. I would grow salad leaves and um, chili plants, chili plants and peppers and cucumbers. So things that in, in our climate in this country don't go, grow so well. Um, I would try to do those in, in a polytunnel, but having a polytunnel is a, you know, it's a, it's a brilliant thing. I suppose the only downside is you need to remember to water. Mm, yeah. Um, what else we've got? Sorry, my mouse has just gone to sleep there we are. Um, also saying, Elizabeth is also saying that apple seeds can be saved from healthy snacks and growing, which is, yeah, another very valid. And they say we've got more green, with more red squirrels in Kilbrony integrated and some brunas, Ross Trevor. So the red squirrel is certainly making a, you know, making a bit of a comeback. That's fantastic. Mm. Has anybody any other questions at all? No? Okay, so I think that, uh, I think everyone seems kind of content enough and happy enough with that. I see, I see that Elizabeth um, has put in that apple seeds can be saved from healthy snacks and grown. That's mm -hmm. absolutely true. Um, also, I, I mean, this is something we'll probably talk about um, through the project, but you're talking about healthy snacks and, you know, everybody's eating fruit now at lunch at bread times, which is fantastic. I think it's a brilliant thing if you can get it organized to make compost mm -hmm. from, you know, apple cores or banana peels and, um, you know, scrunched up paper or cardboard or um, um, a whole mixture of stuff that will really help to feed your soil because good compost um, helps to nourish your soil and that's the foundation of healthy plants, I think. Um, what are the most endangered species and how can we help them? Oh, Ruth. Uh, well, not, I suppose in terms of Northern Ireland, the red squirrel um, is, is pretty endangered. Um, also the barn owl. Um, hedgehogs have been in a, a lot of decline. And actually that's kind of all down to it's all down to habitat. It's all down to, you know, not enough big trees, not enough hedges, um, even in urban areas. You know, everybody's building fences between their houses. Um, and if you if you can leave a hedgehog sized hole, you know, between your fence and the garden next door, that really, really helps if everybody sort of in an area does that. Um, I suppose, you know, I suppose worldwide you've got you've got the rhinoceros and you know, um, but there's good news too in that you know the, the in certain areas like you know gorillas that really 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 were in danger of extinction have kind of the populations have increased, but you know we need to um, we just need to keep minding the stuff and 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 try not to you know to do whatever we can to keep to keep them all with us because we really, really need them. Mm -hmm. um, anything anyone else would like to ask? <clears throat> Thank you so much, everybody, for your time and attention. And um, I'm sure you're 